Good morning. I'm George Willey. Welcome to The Other Side. In this show, we bring guests who are thought leaders. We ask them to consider positions different from their own. Our pursuit is to learn whether we are driven by reason or by passion, by mind or money. Are we ruled by our head or our heart? Today we have Charles Foster, chairman of Foster Global, a premier immigration law firm in Houston with offices in many cities. He's a recognized expert in immigration law and has advised our presidents, including the current one. He heads the Greater Houston Partnership Task Force on Immigration Reform and serves on the boards of several prominent civic organizations. He's the Honorary Consul General for the Kingdom of Thailand and has been recognized for his work by several prestigious institutions. His fame as a lawyer put him on the silver screen when he was featured in the 2010 movie Mao's Last Dancer. He's married to one of China's celebrated movie stars, Lily Chen Foster. Charles is chairman of Asia Society for over 25 years, helped build the organization with the help of Lily into a force that has brought several Asian countries closer to Houston, especially China. Charles, welcome. Thank you, George. Glad to be here. Charles, um, tell us about the movie, um, the uh, Mao's Last Dancer. And I understand you're a movie buff, so so let's hear it. What happened, and how did you manage to get in there? Well, uh, George, uh, it's sort of a, as you're right. I'm a movie buff. Yes. So, and my wife had made many movies, yes. and. Uh, as a fellow lawyer, you would appreciate this. To have one of your cases turned into a movie was was sort so of that's uh, a dream. A big, yes. It was sort of scary, but a big deal. Yes. Uh, if I had not been successful, uh, it, it all started out representing an extraordinary talent from China who had been sent here pursuant to uh, an agreement between the president of the United States and and Deng Xiaoping, the paramount leader of China. And he was the, as far as I know, the first cultural representative sent pursuant to this formal agreement early in our relationship. Yeah. And to simplify, when he decided to stay, it just blew their minds. They could not believe that this individual that had been he sent stay, to yeah. represent China, he had, was guesting with the Houston Ballet, he was an extraordinary talent, that he was going to stay. So to, when they grabbed him, I represented him to to secure his freedom of dramatic stories. I say. So, from a from a legal standpoint, what was it that you were doing for him? Well, from a legal point of view, uh, when he first told me he wanted to stay, I said effectively, no problem. We had a number of options through which uh, we could qualify him to stay through employment, through job skills. Now they detained him in the Chinese uh, consulate. That part we right. never dreamed of. Yes. He at the he wound up going there yes. against my advice. I, I, although candidly I wasn't I never dreamed that, that they would gonna, do that. They they would physically take such dramatic action. Yes. But we went in he went in and he asked me to accompany him in, in very dramatic circumstances, really to take full responsibility to exonerate the Houston Ballet mm -hmm. because the Chinese had accused the ballet of kidnapping him, which oh, turned see. out to be ironic because that's in the end, that's what yeah. the, they did effectively. Right. And also because they were threatening to cut off the reciprocal exchange visit, which was just going to be Houston Ballet. So he went in to say, it was all me, the Houston Ballet did not encourage me, they didn't know it, I kept it very private. And it was during that meeting that they grabbed him. So this is, this is violative of, of a special agreement that the U.S. had with China. That's right. I would say it certainly violated the spirit of his exchange no. agreement. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a formal J-1 exchange program. He had just come in as a visitor to pursuant to uh, what was really the beginning of our diplomatic relations. But anyway, once I was successful, and it's an interesting, a lot of legal issues uh, in securing his release, Lee went on to become the world's greatest male dancer, and then he yes. wrote this extraordinary uh, memoir, Mao's Last Dancer. Yes. They turned that into the movie. And, and then, obviously, he talked about you in the book. 
They, he did because the dramatic highlight, of course, was what happened. Uh, I mean, that was clearly the dramatic highlight of the book and the movie, his and, being seized by the Chinese. And also how he was uh, picked for, for the Chinese ballet was an interesting story as well. Correct. Uh, and then I kind of got a, a glimpse of that. Um, so, uh, who played uh, you in the movie? Well, uh, interestingly, they asked me who I'd like, but uh, they uh, the, they went ahead and did what they thought best. An actor by the name of Kyle MacLachlan, and he had won. Well, he's well known. Yeah. He won two Emmys for Twin Peaks. He's going. I, I, Kyle's become a good friend. They're bringing that show back on okay. Showtime, and many people, many women, I discovered because we spent time together, yes. knew him from Desperate Housewives and uh, oh, Sex in the City. <laughs> yes. And I knew him as a movie buff from a classic movie called Blue Velvet, but he's a very good yes, actor. And yes. you, you will see him again uh, on a revival of the and, film. And uh, who was your pick? To play me? Um, well, I, uh, everyone joked about some big actor. I knew it wasn't going to be that for budgetary. But there was an actor who played a Texas coach uh, in a film and a TV series called uh, Friday Night Lights, and I liked him a lot. Okay. He was sort of a low-key Texan, he had, and so I just somehow identified with him. Okay, yeah, I know you're from Galveston, so yeah. you're not too far from here. Um, but, but then ultimately he ended up uh, in Australia. That's true. Uh, and then he's, he's there still, right? Yeah, uh, Lee, Lee went on to become a superstar here in Houston yeah. for almost 14 years. I remember seeing him, so yeah. yeah he, he, he became a superstar like no other ballet dancer in the history of the ballet, Houston Ballet. All he had to do was walk out on the stage and he would almost get a standing ovation. And then he danced and all the great, uh, uh, he won all sorts of international awards, danced in every great theater in Europe, throughout the world. But he, he married, his wife was from Australia and eventually oh, he went. Oh, I see, that's how he ended up there. Okay. Became a superstar in Australia, then he joined and became a, a uh, investment banker. He missed a stockbroker, yeah. right? Yes, yes, that's what I heard. Okay, so. Well, that, that's that's a good story, uh, and I think uh, yeah, people understand what an immigration lawyer can do. Um, Charles, um, immigration law is in the news. Immigration policy is in the news. Right. Uh, we hear Mr. Trump trumping about his own policy, and yeah. we have uh, Hillary talking about her version of it, and and all across the board. I mean, we hear all of this. Um, so let's. Quickly, we have just not too much time, but quickly, give us a little primer on immigration law. What, what the, how is it structured right now? Well, um, as you know, it's a vast area, and I would simplify this by saying immigration law is like a tariff. It, uh, once upon a time, anyone could enter the United States. We wanted to fill up this vast country. We only excluded certain undesirables like criminals. Mm -hmm. But for the most part of our history, people just came to the U.S. That was it. If you got here, that was all it took. And little by little... They came in a boat. They came in a boat. Yeah. Uh, in fact, the irony is once I met with uh, uh, Rick Santorum, who was running for president. I get to meet these guys. Mm -hmm. uh, they come to me. And Santorum was going around bragging that he was the son of a, which and I, uh, he would be, the, he was the son of an immigrant. And he just wanted people to immigrate like his dad and granddad mm -hmm. had through Ellis Island. Yes. So in our first meeting, I say, Rick, I want to congratulate you. I said, you've got the most, the bravest, the uh, most far-reaching uh, uh, proposal of any candidate. I don't think anyone else would have your guts. And he said, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I said, well, you're proposing open immigration. I said, when your dad, as a child, went through Ellis right. Island, there yes. was no, there was no restri uh, there were no requirements. Right. Ellis Island was just a quarantine station. Right. I said, you'd make everyone, uh, unless Very they had a disease, yeah. they'd all be legal. And he said, oh, no, no, I didn't mean that. <laughs> well, so, actually, you, you, you mentioned that in one of your uh, uh, articles in the Houston Chronicle, I remember, I think, about that time. Yes. Uh, <laughs> all right. So, so, so now we have a policy, we have a, we have a program where, you know, either it's family-based, uh, employment-based, investment-based, you know, those types of yeah. immigration. And of course we have uh, the, the refugees that we take care of. Yes. Now, what I think there is a backlash, right? I mean, uh, in, in this society, look, Donald Trump, uh, his numbers went up after he talked about the Mexican yes. uh, immigrants. Um, 
And now we have Paris, yes. is, uh, yesterday, day before yesterday. Uh, with all of these going on, with, with even with our debt rising to $20 trillion, Charles, um, how can we continue to justify immigration to the United States? Well, I, to me, George, the, the, what, what has happened, which is very uh, discouraging to me, is that the le level of discourse, particularly in the Republican primary, and I'm not a partisan person, I've worked for Republicans, yeah. more Republicans than Democrats, is, uh, is very discouraging because uh, they, they have created this uh, really f completely false picture, mm -hmm. and that's often driven by, the, uh, by media, what I call entertainers, who exaggerate. They would have you believe that the well, border is wide it open. False? Why is it false? Well, uh, there's so many areas to start with. First of all, if you ask the average uh, person based upon the media, they would, they would say the border's wide open, mm -hmm. no enforcement, uh, uh, people are coming without any uh, uh, checks to see if there are security risk, mm -hmm. that, that the vast majority of the people that have come in in undocumented status come here to vote or go on the welfare or, or, and they're criminals. Mm -hmm. Just about every, every one of those statements is completely false. Our border but today. We have 11.5 million people who are undocumented. That's right. But if you look at the statistics, most of them came more than a decade or so ago. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's a fact that today the border is more secure than any time in American history. If you look at the total expenditures on enforcement, 90 percent of which is going to our border, mm -hmm. it's 20 billion dollars a year. And I tell people, you cannot say you're spending 20 billion dollars a year and that the, the border is wide open. Right. Okay. This, in the last decade, we've doubled the number of, of Border Patrol, and the, the numbers that are, that are coming in in undocumented status are the lowest it has been in more than since Richard Nixon was president. But you would never know that listening to the politicians. They would believe it's more dangerous, more open. So I think part of the problem is that the American people have been misinformed about this issue. Uh, so what is the truth? The truth is the U.S. Is, uh, greatly benefits and will continue to benefit from legal immigration, number one. It's a net positive for uh, in any way you measure. In terms of the problems of undocumented illegal immigration, the problem, we've actually got it under better control than we've ever had in the last two or three decades, but we need to endure, uh, enact comprehensive immigration reform. That's those words have, uh, are dirty words now for many, but as you know, comprehensive means we have to deal with all parts of it. Uh, we can just spend so many more billions of dollars a on the border before it, uh, it becomes completely redundant and wasteful. Hold Part that thought, Charles. Okay. Stay with us. We'll be back with Charles Foster on the other side. On the other side, we interview a variety of people and seek to examine their beliefs, their opinions, and their passions. Then we invite them to come with us to the other side and look at the antithesis of their views. What comes out is an in-depth conversation without the vitriol of the talk shows, but a cerebral engaging of ideas you will not find anywhere else. Come join us on alternate Saturdays at 8.30 a.m. on this channel. If you'd like to recommend a guest for the other side, contact us at the email address on the screen. Welcome back to the other side. We were talking to Charles about immigration policy here. Charles is an expert in the field. He's uh, He's uh, testified before Congress and advised uh, President Bush as well as President Obama. Right. Um, Charles, we were talking about what the, the, the sort of thinking now in the country about immigration, at least the vociferous ones, uh, the, the, the ones that are influencing even presidential candidates. Uh, so how would you then justify immigration law, immigration policy, just allowing immigrants to come in. You know, George, uh, the way I would put it is this. Everyone 
sort of broadly, they have these broad-based concerns. Oh, too many immigrants, we have too much undocumented immigration. Mm -hmm. I was going to say that's why you need comprehensive reform, because you can't just seal the border. You need legal avenues for people to come in when there's needed workers, et cetera. Yeah. But the way I could justify it. So the question is, do we need immigrants? Absolutely. Yeah. If you look at who, who are the legal immigrants, most people would be surprised. And if you break it down, they would agree. The number one category, as you know, are, is, is based upon family reunification. Mm -hmm. My wife. You can petition for your wife, for your children, for your parents, mm -hmm. your brothers and sisters. Now, some people might say, well, brothers and sisters are a little too far away. But how long do they have to wait? Yes, and you're right. There's a 13 to 14 year backlog. But, but se about 70% of all legal immigrants are based upon the concept of family reuni reunification. Mm -hmm. Who would say that American citizens should not be able to have their children or their spouse? And I would say, what's wrong with having your parents here? My wife qualified her parents, and they've been an integral part of our family yes. for throughout our marriage. Mm -hmm. So that's the number one. The second part, as you know, is based upon the ability of employers to prove that there's not a single willing, able, qualified U.S. worker. and. Uh, when they cannot, at the prevailing wage, as determined by the U.S. Department of Labor, find a qualified worker that's essential to the operation of their business. Who would, who would be against that? Or they come in, uh, as you know, under a lofty uh, level. Persons of extraordinary ability. Extraordinary ability. All of the, you know, we've got some Nobel laureates, and we've got uh, extraordinary ability folk, people with national interest waivers. That's right. Yeah. Key people in the Texas Medical Center, in our universities. Mm -hmm on the baseball field, with the Houston Astros, with the Houston Rockets. These are extraordinary talent. Who would be against that? And what would, uh, they said that uh, a, a, a good percentage of uh, folks that, uh, that started companies that have become big, like Google and, and, right. and uh, uh, Intel. That's right. And, Immi uh, uh, immigrants yeah. set up a they much, set up. So, very high percentage so of business. So their contributions have run into billions and trillions of dollars. That's so right. obviously, I mean, you know, and, and, and above all that, this country is a country of immigrants. That's who, true. You know, I, it doesn't matter who, uh, they may be the native Indians, but uh, everybody else is, is, yeah. has come somewhere, uh, uh, someplace. Um, Charles, I don't want to let you go without talking about Asia Society, yes. your baby, yes. um, and and you have, well, you've been uh, you chaired that for nearly twenty five years, correct, and uh, and uh, then you're now on the board, of course, um, and then you have developed, you built that uh, society to become a force now in 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 this city. Um, so, tell us about what what Asia Society, what does it do, and and, and what has your yeah. contributions been. Well, uh, I got involved in the Asia Society uh, decades ago because it was the go-to organization. It was dedicated to the proposition since the 50s when it was started by John Rockefeller III to educate Americans about the broad, diverse countries, cultures, and people of Asia. And All does those he countries. have a collection of, of, uh, of art from Asia? That collection was the really was the genesis of the Asia Society. He and wanted I that to be that housed. I saw that in New York. Yes. I mean, wow. Yes. Yeah, so and when we opened our new home yes. three years ago, yes. we, we had we we had a large exhibition of the Rockefeller collection. Oh my God! Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. So mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, it was started in the 50s in Houston. We started a, a center uh, under the auspices of Roy Huffington, a w internationally known oil man. And as you said, about 25 years ago, I became the chairman, and we. Uh, we had programs uh, to own policy issues, business issues, again about the diverse countries of Asia. So, so, so Asia sort of deals with policy. The, you, you, you also have so uh, artists come That's perform right. and, and, and also you know talk about some of the things that they've done. Well, when we one of that was sort of the rationale I, when uh, when we first started talking about. I came back from a meeting in New York and propose that we build our own home. I didn't realize it was going to be such an extensive, lengthy, and expensive yes. project. But as a result of that, we now have one of the most beautiful performing arts theaters. We have yes. gallery space. Yes. So we can completely fulfill our mission because we put on, we have performing artists, mm -hmm. we have movie festivals, 
and we can have exhibitions uh, in our gallery space and on our walls of the art that reflect the culture of, of the diverse countries that comprise Asia. And, uh, and obviously, you know, it is now placed in a really a beautiful building. Uh, tell, tell us about how that building came about. Well, the building came about uh, when, uh, again, the genesis was uh, really going back a, uh, more than almost 15 years ago, I proposed to the board that we build our home. Again, I had a very modest view of that just so we'd have a permanent place for our programming. But um, I appointed a, a committee, uh, to, uh, an architectural selection committee, and they picked an extraordinary architect by the name of uh, Yoshio Taniguchi. Uh, isn't and that a beautiful design? He had been the architect of, uh, of the new MoMA facility, Museum of Modern Art in New York. He was an internationally renowned architect from Tokyo. And he really designed uh, what uh, some critics have called a, uh, a work of art. It's like wa walking through a work of art. Oh, wow. And our budget went, we had what's called uh, mission creep, our budget went up, but <laughs> we were able to raise the money and yeah. we now, we have now contributed to the Houston region this extraordinary piece of uh, architecture and we're able to bring in uh, performing arts groups and, and uh, exhibitions. Yes, and your programs have got uh, sizzling performances and, and some of the speakers that come up. Yes. So what does Asia Society well, what is its mission? What does it want to do? I think I, I would still say it, it is a platform to bring uh, where uh, East meets West, mm -hmm. where uh, it's a, it is, again, it's an educational, uh, not only an educational platform so that people of diverse backgrounds can learn more about the, uh, about the different countries and peoples of Asia, but also we can pr uh, provide liaison between different groups, institutions in the U.S. with Asia. So when, when performance, performers come here uh, either to perform or to speak or to do whatever else that they do, how, how, are, they, how are they funded? Well, we, uh, we, like every nonprofit, we have our budgetary considerations. One of my dreams is uh, being in the uh, immigration field like you, I'm fully aware of the large immigrant communities from Asia but they tend to be on the fringes of, uh, of, of Houston, yes. in Chinatown, uh, Koreantown, yes. et cetera. Yes. And they have great programming, but if you look at uh, the attendees, they're gonna be those immigrant communities. So I always dreamed that we would have our facility in the heart of Houston, inside the uh, 610, in the museum district, where we could bring those programmings to a broader audience in Houston. Yeah, I noticed that uh, you, know, you had uh, uh, you know, Cambodian, issues. I've seen Malaysian and I've yeah. seen some of the things which we didn't, didn't hear about That's right. uh, before uh, and, and some of the old art that they, they bring, some of the, some of the cultural uh, things that they bring to the city. I think uh, clearly that's also contributed to the fact that we are one of the most diverse cities uh, in, the, in, the, in the country. Right. Uh, and, and so that's been a, a contribution that I think you've made to the, to the city. Um, so what do you, uh, th what's going to be your role uh, in Asia Society now that you step down as chair? Well, I did step down. After 25 years, I felt like I had accomplished uh, a lot and I wanted to leave before uh, when I was still ahead. You, I had, by that time, I had stayed as chairman and on the board in New York uh, much longer than anybody had ever had done so in history. So I was glad to... I, I watch you do things and yeah. I get exhausted just watching you go around, Charles. Uh, you know, you, you have a large law, law firm and then on top of that you do all of these other things. How do you do it? Well, I don't know. I, I ask myself, I keep on, I tell you the truth, George, I keep on saying I'm going to stop, stop. and then I, then I come up with one more idea. I could tell you what the projects right. I have going, but uh, you'd be surprised. I'm sure the, 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 that time when you, when you say, Lily, you know, I'm thinking of doing this, and she's going, oh, not another one. Yes, again. that's true. <laughs> um, Charles, um, let me go back to, to immigration policy a little bit. Um, you know, we are obviously, uh, you know, you know, screening towards a uh, presidential election, you know, screeching actually towards a, a, a presidential election. Uh, Hillary, Trump, 
you know, look like four run, four front runners. So we don't know where that's going to go. So let's, f for a minute, you know, as, as I, you know, to, to quote John Lennon, imagine all the people, yeah. you know, and then see whether, you know, under Hillary, what the country will look like, immigration policy, and what Trump's policy would yes. look like. So, you know, I know that's, that's a huge, big question. Yeah. But, but just kind of give, give me a few thoughts okay. on that. Okay. Well, since this is an issue I, I literally deal with every yes. day, and yes. I'm really involved in the intersection of immigration law policy and politics in a big way, mm -hmm. I will be very candid with you. I think uh, Hillary Clinton is in the mainstream. She, she su broadly supports comprehensive immigration reform. There's, there's some details where she'll differ with others, but, and the, the real challenge for the Republican Party is can the Republican Party nominate someone within that mainstream? Because if they fail to do so, if they were to nominate a Trump or Trump-like candidate, uh, even Carson, uh, they would lose the Hispanic vote overwhelming. And most people do not fully appreciate that because this election is fought in a handful of what's referred to as top, uh, toss up toss states. Yeah, huh. And at least four of those Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico, and, and Florida, Florida yeah. the Hispanic vote is critical. Yes. And so many people, they miss that point. Uh, President because. Not only that, the Asian vote. The Asian vote has become. Yes. In fact, I say this. Everyone knows that Governor Romney lost three to one the Hispanic vote to President Obama, yes. but he lost the Asian American voter in even larger numbers, larger numbers to President Obama. I saw the study, yeah. And Asian, as you know, Asian Americans are the fastest growing percentage-wise part of our society. Yes. Overall, Hispanic Americans are the fastest growing in terms of overall numbers. The key vote was in Colorado where over this issue, the president didn't carry it three to four, uh, three to one, he carried it nine out of 10 votes yes. where that was in the, a toss-up state. Yes. So I would have to say that a Trump-like candidate, Trump so will, will- Probably can make it. There's but no way they could win. But defying all of the, yeah. all of the predictions. Within, and all of within the a percentage of the Republican base. And the problem is you win these elections in the middle in, uh, in these toss-up states. The Republican base will go Republican, the Democratic base. So there's no way that a Republican, in my opinion, no Republican can win on an anti, win the general election on an anti-immigrant policy. Platform. I don't think that's gonna happen. Um, Charles, thank you. It's been a pleasure having pleasure. you on this. Um, thank you for joining us this morning on the other side. Join us next time when we walk another guest to the other side.